I want to talk with you all today about something that, in one sense, as you'll see at the beginning of my talk, is really serious. And we might even say is a little scary, which is the significance and the precariousness of our planetary predicament and where we are with what's happening to the planet. And then what I want to do is share with you what I have found to be not only for me the most promising way to create health and resilience for the whole planet, but I actually have become convinced it's the only way. And so what I did was about 20 years ago, I was in graduate school studying atmospheric science and learning about how clouds interact in the atmosphere and how they relate to climate modeling. And a lot of people don't know this, that clouds are the hardest part of climate models and the place that's the biggest source of uncertainty because they can just change in so many ways. They're so dynamic. And while I was in this amazing, like as an opportunity to be at a world-class university, the University of Illinois, learning with some of the best scientists in the world, and I decided to make use of their libraries and I gave myself a challenge, like as a New Year's resolution. It's like, okay, New Year's Eve, I'll give myself one year and I can depress the hell out of myself, but I wanna know the planetary crisis. I wanna know what's going on to the planet, with the planet. And I was actually depressed and traumatized for about 10 years from that exercise. So I had to learn how to go into the trauma and the grieving and come out on the other side. And in the 20 years between then and now, I have been looking for a way to get to planetary sustainability. How could it possibly happen? And I would find something go, ooh, urban sustainability and net zero cities. Oh, it's actually more complicated and global supply chains don't work that way and they might not, not, might not work. And oh wait, there's this green energy revolution. Oh wait, it's all based on mining and extraction and destruction of other ecosystems. That might not get us to sustainability. And I kept pruning away the possibilities until I was left with just one. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is what I discovered on that journey, which I'm gonna explore with you in two parts. One part is I'm trained as an earth system scientist. So I learned how do the dynamic systems of the earth work? And then the other is how does human culture work? What is it about humans? What are we, how do we work? How do we relate to our landscapes and to our histories and to our economies and to our stories and to each other? And so it's in this realm that something started to come out. Now I wanna begin by showing you two things about my opening slide. The first one is you don't see my name on it. That's not by accident. Because I'm not here to speak as Joe Brewer, I'm here to speak on behalf of the earth. I've been learning lessons from this beautiful planet and I wanna share them with you as closely as I can coming from her. And the other is these words, regenerate the earth. These are words that I started using a few years ago and I was surprised, I did like my Google search, like who else is talking about earth regeneration? It was me and the crickets. Now there are a lot more people talking about it but I was surprised, like, why aren't people talking about regenerating the earth? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? And then I started to slowly realize that there were two reasons why people weren't using this language. It's not because I was clever at marketing. One was that there were enough people who knew about the planetary crisis that were so depressed and traumatized by it that they really thought that the planet would be better off if she just shook off the humans like a bad parasite. And now when the humans go extinct, the planet will be better off. And I saw a lot of that. I even felt a little bit of that myself a little earlier in my life. The other reason that people weren't using this language was because it seemed impossible. It seemed unbelievable. It's like, we can't even get our own city parks cleaned up. We think we're going to regenerate the whole earth? Like there was this idea, this like incredulity. Like they couldn't allow themselves to believe that it was possible. And so when I started talking to people about regenerating the earth, a healing process began for many people. And so I wanna share with you this story of how to regenerate the earth. 
But that means we have to start with a very clear and realistic understanding of where the Earth is right now and what's going on. And before we get to that, I just want us to notice something about this image, which is that when you look at the Earth from space, you'll see that it's a completely holistic, integrated system. There are no boundaries. There are no walls. There are no compartments. I mean, just look at the water. All over the ocean, there's water. There are rivers and lakes on the land. And then the clouds are just mixing the water through the air. It's completely integrated. So anything we do to create artificial separation, which are projections of the human mind, is going to keep us from seeing how the Earth works. And so we need to hold in mind that the interdependencies of the whole Earth really matter. So with that said, I want to share with you something that I learned when I traveled around the world looking at different kinds of regenerative projects. I saw this. Every one of them takes place on a plot of land. Like I might go to an amazing permaculture project and it's like a 20 acre project. They're doing wonderful things, but there's maybe someone dropping pollution in the water upstream that comes down or there's something downstream and they have their plot of land. There are hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of regenerative projects at a small scale. But all of them have larger ecological connections, like that movement of water that can go downstream across a piece of land. And a lot of projects, they're so focused on getting their projects to work, which is really good, because then they do great projects. So someone's doing like, I've got this great regenerative farm, or I'm doing this reforestation work, or whatever. I'm really focused on it. I don't have time or capacity to work on these larger ecological connections. But then those ecological connections are embedded within holistic landscapes, like entire watersheds for a river, or entire mountain ranges, or an entire coastal estuary. There are these larger holistic landscapes that exist that are where all of those ecological connections occur. But then those landscapes are embedded within planetary processes, dynamics of the whole Earth. What I realized when I saw this problem that everyone was focused on their little piece of land or their big piece of land was that the problem is not that we work at any one of these scales. That's not how we get to the other side. What we need to do is look at the interactions between the scales. We have to look at what happens as we move up and down these scales. And when we do that, we'll start to see some organizing patterns that we can work with to do local work in a place and have planetary consequences. Before we go any further, I might call this, this is the shadow part of the talk, because we need to face the truth. Who here has heard of the planetary boundaries? Raise your hand if you've heard of them. A few of you, it's more than normal. I'm, I'm glad to hear this is spreading. So planetary boundaries is a framework developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center it's a collaboration of more than 3,500 Earth system scientists. So this is not lightweight, marginal stuff. This is like mainstream, sort of the, the standard knowledge of the field of Earth system science. So the way that this framework works is like this. Back in about 2009, there were a couple of scientists who said, with everything we know about the dynamic Earth, are there any thresholds or boundaries that if we cross them, we would leave the Holocene, which is this 12,000 year period of warm, stable climate, which is the only time we've ever had agriculture, empires, civilizations. Are there any of those thresholds? And they did the research and gathered the data and they came together and they said, oh, there are nine. There are nine planetary boundaries. If we cross even one, then a global civilization is called into question because all civilizations existed with warm, stable planetary climate. So look, climate change is only one of them. Climate change is only one. Then you have biosphere integrity, which is the rate of extinction when species go away. You have biosphere integrity means the species are intact. The loss of biosphere integrity is the rate of extinction. You might have heard 
that we are entering the sixth mass extinction event, caused largely by land system change, which is when you take complex ecosystems and you degrade them, like cutting down a forest to put in agriculture or to build cities or with desertification. Then you have fresh water use. Then you have biogeochemical flows, which is phosphorus and nitrogen from synthetic fertilizers used in industrial agriculture. If you have too much nitrogen and phosphorus, it runs off into the rivers, runs into the ocean, and creates these massive dead zones in the world's ocean. Then you have ocean acidification. Then you have atmospheric aerosol loading, or air pollution. Then you have stratospheric ozone depletion, because the ozone layer protects us from dangerous ultraviolet radiation that could kill all life on land. And then there's another category that's just called novel entities, something that's added to the Earth system that it can't manage. So I said, all right, we've got nine. There are nine planetary boundaries. If we cross even one, global civilization may not continue. It's, it's called into question. So, OK, obvious follow-up question. How are we doing? Have we crossed any of them? So in 2015, they published that we'd already crossed four. We crossed it for climate change, biosphere integrity, land system change, and biogeochemical flows. But then the research continued, and they got better, better, better knowledge, and now they had this framework to look at. And then they said, well, all right, as of 2021, we can confirm that freshwater use and ocean acidification have crossed it too. It doesn't mean that they crossed between 2015 and 2021, but just that they had to go and ask the question and gather the data and have all of the debates among the scientific community, and this is what came out. But then in 2022, they added microplastics because microplastics, long-lasting synthetic chemicals, are now present in every glass of water and in the breast milk of every woman on Earth. Microplastics are ubiquitous across the planet. So for all of the concern about climate change, we actually have crossed six others as well. And we've already crossed them. This isn't in the future. This is the present. This is where we are right now. And so the lesson for us here is that our planet is a profoundly interdependent system with a very important harmony and balance that the planet as a whole will hold. And I want to show you how these interdependencies work by telling you the story of this blue region on the African continent, which we might call Sub-Saharan Africa, or it's also called the Sahel Desert. Sahel, this is the Sahel region. Now, some of you who are older will remember that back in the 1980s and 1990s, there were all those starving kids in Africa, and Suzanne, Suzanne Struthers would go on TV for Save the Children, and she'd say, donate money to, for all the starving kids. Of course, there were starving adults, too. But do you know why they were starving? I was surprised to realize that I didn't know. I grew up with this awareness there was this massive starvation that happened for decades across the African continent. Well, see, it wasn't easy to find the answer. The answer came out in climate modeling journals between 2010 and 2012. And of course, it was not only not yesterday's news, it was last century's news, so it didn't even get reported on. So the story works like this. This is a map made by NASA of sulfate aerosols, where sulfates are in the atmosphere. And while this is a modern, this is like what's happening now, you might notice that, look, there's this big circulation, this big flow that brings the aerosols from southern Europe down to Central Africa. So the way it worked was this. Between 1870 and 1940, industrialism started in Europe. There were three cities that burned a lot of coal that had sulfur in them. Those cities were London, Paris, and Berlin. And they accumulated sulfate aerosols in the air by burning the coal that released the sulfur. Sulfate aerosols can either lengthen or shorten the lifetime of clouds, depending on if they're low in the atmosphere or high in the atmosphere. So they can change the energy distribution of the atmosphere. And what happened 
was these sulfate aerosols changed the statistical composition of clouds in Europe. And then there's this place called the Intertropical Convergence Zone around the Tropic of Cancer, where the jet streams come together. And this change in clouds shifted the movement of clouds and the movement of weather systems in the tropics. But those are connected with what's called the intertropical convergence zone of the subtropics near the Tropic of Capricorn, which is about right here. And so you have this cascading effect of changing weather systems. Now look at this. This is this green bar here is the rainfall in the Sahel region. Because the Sahel had a monsoon, which means that there was, like clockwork, there was always rain. And look, between 1950 and 1965, always rain. From 1965 to 1970, it got weaker. And in 1970, it shut off. As the Sahel monsoon shut off, this caused agriculture throughout sub-Saharan Africa to collapse, leading to violence, genocide, and mass starvation. So it was really difficult to piece together the story that it was those sulfate aerosols from industrialism with cascading effects across decades that caused the Sahel monsoon to shut down. This was invisible. Look, it was like from 1870 to 1940, it accumulated the effect. And then the monsoon shut down 30 years later. It was invisible because there was a chain of causation. There were different cause-effect relationships in different parts of the system. It was over a long distance. It's about 8,000 kilometers from Southern Europe to Central Africa. It was delayed in time by decades. So by the time the monsoon shut down, the causes were obscured in history. And no one was really measuring sulfate aerosols anyway. So they had this other problem, which was there were interwoven narratives. There were different stories being told in different places at different times about what was happening. And of course, there was a lot more going on than that. But you can see that this story was hidden in the interdependencies of the planet. The lesson for us is this. The Earth is a whole system with cascading relationships and time delays. And those cascading relationships and those time delays create systemic risk, risk that comes from the systemic nature of the Earth as a whole, not from a single cause-effect relationship. And breakdown unfolds across space and time. And it also unfolds across chains of causation, which means you have to reconstruct the whole dynamic of the system to even find it in the first place. While this is really scary to say, wow, what kinds of breakdowns are coming in 20 or 30 years from what's already happened today, because the, the effects are delayed in space and time, there's also a silver lining to this message. The silver lining is that if we understand how the different parts of the Earth interact with each other, then we can actually build up systemic resilience. We can engage in practices that restore the health and well-being of the smaller parts of the system that have cumulative cascading effects to other parts of the system, which means we can engage in local actions with an understanding of how they're connected to other parts of the planet. And we can bring benefits to our own place and to other parts of the planet at the same time by understanding those interdependencies. So the real beauty of Earth system science is that it enables us to see how the Earth as a whole works. So this brings us to where we start to talk about, I'm not going to say the solution, because our planetary crisis is a predicament. Problems have solutions. Predicaments happen when there are so many interdependencies that as you try to solve something, you create problems somewhere else. We have to navigate the complexity. There will be real hardship and real loss. There already has been, like what happened in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is not going to be easy, but there is a way. There is a way to regenerate the Earth. And one of the really profound insights, which sounds deceptively simple, is that everything that happens on Earth happens somewhere. 
There is a place. It always comes from somewhere. So let's begin by seeing where we are. There we are. We're in the greater Toronto area near Lake Ontario on the North American continent. So we're in a place, right? We're in a place. What kind of place is this? What kind of a place are you in? Well, to start to think about your place, let's zoom out and look at the context of our place. And we can see that here's the Toronto area, and it's embedded within the Great Lakes. How much water is in the Great Lakes? I was surprised to learn. The Great Lakes hold 20% of all of the fresh water on Earth. So 99% of the water on Earth is salt water. 99% is salt water. 1% is fresh water. Of the 1% that's fresh water, one fifth of it is in the Great Lakes. Just for comparison, this is the same amount of water as the entire Amazon rainforest, which has 200 rivers in it. That means that this is the most concentrated fresh water supply on the planet. The Great Lakes is a strategic reserve of planetary significance. There is an embarrassment of riches for water in the Great Lakes. So if you think of the Great Lakes in this way, you might notice things like, huh, if we're in this great fresh water supply, what happens when other people don't have water? Those climate refugees might all migrate here. What are we going to do about that? Oh, there are these interdependencies with other parts of the planet. We need to start thinking about those. So you see, nearly half the fresh water on Earth is in these two very special places. And while we've heard a lot about the Amazon and its importance, how much do you hear people around the world talking about the Great Lakes? Because people are not thinking in a planetary way. If you think in a planetary way, the Great Lakes become significant. You, you just take the globe and turn it. Where else do you find water like this? Nowhere. This is the only place on Earth. And by the way, the Amazon rainforest is on schedule to make a permanent transition to grassland savanna as it collapses due to fragmentation and deforestation. And the threshold is likely to be crossed in the next two to three years. Which means pretty soon the Great Lakes might be 30% of the world's fresh water supply as the Amazon dries out. Because all of these things are in process and they're happening now. Now you might notice there are a couple of things I've said that are not consistent with the policy discourse about climate change. You know, we have until 2030 to avoid abrupt climate change, all these lies that are propagated to keep the status quo. We are running past these tipping points now. And some of them we crossed 30 years ago. And so when we think about how we regenerate the Earth, we have to understand how the Earth actually works. And we have to see these relationships. So what's interesting is that if you look at something like the continent of Africa, this is like this huge continent. And I go, well, how does land organize itself? How would we organize around place? This is a visualization of the river systems of Africa. So if I was to ask you, how would you restore the health of the entire continent of Africa? You'd be like, damn, I have no idea. There are like 55 countries. This thing's huge. I once flew from like Chicago to India, and it was the same amount of time as flying from London to Cape Town. Africa's huge. This continent is so big. You can't imagine trying to regenerate the whole continent. But if you look at it as rivers, Oh gosh, look at that, those rivers. There are maybe 300, 400 of them. So you could imagine each river having its own group of people working to restore the health and vitality of that river, collaborating across the whole continent. Which brings me to where I live. This is a map of the topography of Colombia in South America. These are the Andes. That way is Panama. And right here in this section, there's a mountain range that creates a rain shadow, which means all the moisture has to come from the south. So there's a half of the year when it's like a desert, half the year where it's like a rainforest. And inside this area is a regional climate system that is defined by the mountain range itself. And I live in a little town called Barichara. It's right in the middle of that. It's got a unique ecosystem like no other on Earth. Eight out of 10 species are endemic. They only exist there and nowhere else. And this forest is more than 95% cut down 
They deforested it for monoculture agriculture, mostly corn, beans, and squash, and tobacco. And now the whole area is becoming a desert, and all the rivers are drying out or dead. The ones that still have water are terribly contaminated. If you've ever been to Latin America, you'll find that people just flush their toilets directly into the river, like our town of Barichara does, without any processing, and all the kids downstream have cancer. This is happening all over Latin America. And so we have this really big challenge, but we have a well-defined region. We're working to restore a unique land type, a unique ecosystem within a well-defined regional climate system. There's Barichara itself. It's called the most beautiful town in Colombia. It's a major tourist destination for Colombians. It's also the indigenous home of the Guane people who were pretty much successfully destroyed by genocide in the 1700s. There are a few remnants of their people around, but they're pretty much in tatters. And this picture is taken from a place called Bio Parque Moncora, which is a six and a half hectare community reforestation project where I get to do some work with them. And I just wanted you to see it. It's a really beautiful place. Barichara is a really beautiful place. And what we're doing is we're creating a design school for healing the entire landscape. We are creating a school that says, well, there are all these projects. Remember, I said each project is on a plot of land? So here's Bio Parque Moncora. Over here's a project called Oriente del Agua. Here's a project called Agua Santa. Here's a project that's a community, a community garden. We have all these different projects that people are doing in the landscape. And we are working to integrate them at the scale of the landscape as a whole. The kinds of patterns that enable us to do this. I know it's hard to read the text, because I really just want to give you the high level. Some of the ways that we're helping to bring together these projects is that there are naturally occurring patterns across the landscape. So for example, we're working on the restoration of entire watersheds. There's the Barichara River with 15 tributaries. So we can organize around the restoration of the watershed. We've created a learning center in Centropic Agroforestry. I'll talk a little bit about Centropic Agroforestry in a moment. But the important thing is that we're building demonstration sites in different parts of the territory based on the connectivity of the land. And then we're teaching people reforestation techniques with agroforestry systems so that they can grow food, construction materials, medicinal plants, and textiles for clothing, all within the agroforestry system, while at the same time restoring soils and restoring the watershed. We're working on the transformation of local food systems. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. Amazingly, we have about 70% uh, of the food in Barichara comes from within 10 kilometers away. We have an incredible food shed, better than most places. But we're establishing a community market. Local food growers are coming together and collaborating, teaching each other techniques to improve their land management practices. And we're designing alternative economic models based on the commons, based on solidarity, and based on relocalization, bringing things back into the local economy. These are patterns of regeneration, economic regeneration, social regeneration, food system, um, landscape regeneration, watershed regeneration, all being done at the same time to create a prototype for a, a landscape scale regenerative economy. And we do things like this, where we have the kids come together. This is my friend Felipe in the middle. He's got this amazing insight, similar to Susan and Brian, that intergenerational relationships are important. He's got four kids of, him, of his own. He's a really good dad. And Felipe realized that the best way to restore the watershed was to get the kids to ask the adults what happened to the water. So he has the kids walk in the landscape through the watershed, walking along the rivers, and asking the adults, why did the water go away? Why can't we go fishing here? What happened? You know, why is it so dry? And they're creating this intergenerational dynamic to grow the conscience of the adults. And then they can bring in indigenous elders and other wisdom holders, like this man from the Muisca culture. And they share with the kids how to build an ethic of the sacred in their relationship to land. And this is part of a project called Pasos de Agua, which is translates from Spanish as where the water walks, the steps of water. Because they're walking the footsteps of water to bring the water back. 
And then we have these interesting things that when the kids get together, they engage in governance. Here's a seven-year-old girl named Quetzal presenting her ideas for how to restore the watershed. It's amazing how well the adults listen when the kids have better ideas than the adults. And I just want you to see that, yes, they have the help of teachers and adults that are there, but the ideas are from the kids. Because we decided that in Barichara, the kids know how to restore watersheds, because they're going to do it while they're kids. And when they grow up, they'll go to other places and teach other people how to bring their dead rivers back to life. And this is an intergenerational dynamic where the kids, she's there with her grandma, that's Soraya and that's Gabriella. And when we sit in adult council, when we sit in circles among the adults, we make sure the kids are in the center of the circle, just like many indigenous cultures do. Because we know that these kids may not seem to be listening, but they're going to remember what we talked about. And so we're designing this in. This is intentional in the way that we restore the watershed. But then look, if you see projects like this Bio Parque Moncora, which is that reforestation project I mentioned earlier, see it's located right here on the edge of the town, but there are other projects nearby, like down at the bottom of the cliff or just over across the little greenway. And the idea is that when we look at these projects, we don't think of them as isolated islands. We see them as having connections to each other in the landscape. And of course, as adults, we have a lot of trauma, a lot of trauma healing. So we engage in activities to rebuild trust and learn how to cooperate in service to the territory. But just imagine if the kids were never traumatized. Just imagine if we bypassed all of that intergenerational trauma that most of us have as adults. So we really focused on how to build a cultural cushion around the children so that they can move right into a culture of regeneration. We're doing this to fast track the process. This is my daughter, Elise. She was going to plant this cactus. I, I sort of have a problem. I'm a little addicted to planting cactus. Um, I keep finding them and planting them in other places. Because it turns out cactus plants are really good as they're pollinators. They grow delicious fruit. And they store water so you don't have to irrigate. Pretty sweet. And then we're teaching the children how to be the leaders. What you see here is the little kids on the left, the bigger kids on the right. The little kids were asked to find a superpower from an object in nature and gift it to the older kids to help them on their journey to restore a river. So what we're doing is we are letting the land teach us and we're working with everyone in the community to create a different kind of economy. And the organizing principle for all of this, the way to think about it and understand it, is to understand what is a bioregion. And the word bioregion is just short for biological region. If you've heard the word bioregionalism, which was associated with the back to the land movement in the 1960s and 70s, it's often thought of as like a political movement. Like, we're going to walk away from the nation state and go and live on our own as the world collapses. There's some truth in that. But the key thing is that it's actually a technical definition from ecology. A bioregion is the geographic range in which the entire life system of an organism and its population can exist. Or said here, the entire context for the life system of an entire biological population. So let's use starfish as our example. A starfish lives in a very specific landscape. It lives in what's called the intertidal zone. The intertidal zone is on the coastline between the low water mark and the high water mark of the tides. And there might be tide pools, there might be coral reefs, but the entire life system of the starfish is in the geography of the intertidal zone all of the food that they need, their shelter, their ability to reproduce, everything for their whole life system. So a sustainable pattern of life is, by definition, a biological region. So a bioregion is a definition for sustainability. When we apply this to starfish, it's pretty easy to understand. But when we apply it to humans, 
it gets a little bit more interesting because we have this cultural ability to adapt and change how we live in landscapes. But it turns out that we can do that too. We can define bioregions for humans. So if each bioregion creates a whole system for the life system, then it can become a whole system model, which means we can build our way of living modeled after the whole system of the bioregion. And if different places on Earth do this, then we can create a planetary network of bioregions and we can engage in learning and exchanges with each other. So you could be here creating a bioregion, we could be down in Colombia creating a bioregion, and we can collaborate with each other. See, what needs to happen is this. We need to recreate, because they don't exist now, we need to recreate the conditions for living locally in terms of material flows. When I say integrated life systems, I mean to be able to relate in a harmonious way with the rest of life, with the other species, wherever we are, the thriving of families and communities. Now, what's interesting about this way of thinking is if you look at a map like this one, you can start to see how to do it. The colors on this map tell us that there are different ecotypes, different ecosystem types. What this means is that the kind of soils that are there, the kind of microclimate, the kind of ecosystem determines what kinds of life can be there. So we should expect that if there are a lot, of, a lot of local living economies for humans, that we would see the cultural diversity. There would be different human cultures, different kinds of economies in each landscape. Like the way the indigenous people did it, because they self-organized their cultures into a bioregional framework. They just evolved them that way naturally. That's not by accident. So there was a famous study in 1972 called Limits to Growth. It was a, a computer simulation led by a group of researchers at MIT. And they asked the question, how do we understand the material flows of the global economy? And then let's create some scenarios of the future. And they created a scenario called business as usual. That's where that word comes from, business as usual, it came from the Limits to Growth study. And they saw exactly the collapse patterns that we're in right now. While they did not forecast what is happening, we have tracked business as usual so well that their computer simulation gives a realistic representation of what's happening now, 50 years later. But during the 10 years between 1972 and 1982, they gathered the best thinkers they could from universities all over the world, and they said, what do we do? How do we live within planetary limits? How do we create planetary sustainability? And out of that came an essay written in 1983. Vernon Rutten, who is an agronomist, so he studied economic patterns for agriculture, he said this. He said, each agroeconomic region is so unique that the concept of transfer of technology is irrelevant. What's relevant is the transfer of the capacity to develop technology and institutions that are consistent with the cultural endowment and the research endowment of each region. And then Dana Meadows, who is the lead author of the Limits to Growth study, who literally wrote the book System Thinking, said this. Out of these 10 years of, of dialogues and research came a vision of a number of centers where information and models about resources and the environment are housed. There would need to be many of these centers all over the world, each one responsible for a distinct bioregion. She said this in 1983, 40 years ago. Now what happened after 1983? Our entire conversation about the planet became reduced to the minutia of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and how to measure the levels of it and change them. And now we're all talking about getting to 350 parts per million, even though we don't care about rate of extinction, biodiversity and climate change don't talk to each other. It's insane. I was six years old when this was written. And no better solution has been found since, because this is the way to do it. So in Bari Chara, we have all these different kinds of projects. I don't need you to be able to read the words. I know they're really tiny. I just want you to see there are lots of different kinds of projects. For example, this project called Caneco Libri is a community theater where children learn the stories and the history of their place through indigenous and environmental perspectives. Then there are projects like Casa Comun, which is a local economy of exchanges among local producers and artisans. 
or projects like La Huerta Comunitaria, which is a community garden among about 20 families working on local food resilience within their area of the rural landscape, or Fundacion Monte Chico, which is about preserving and teaching children the cultural practices of native plants for textiles and natural fibers. And the idea is, if you look at projects like this, you don't know how to organize them. You don't know how to put them together. But if you put them onto the map, you start to see that the land itself has organizing principles. Like we can follow the track of the surface water in the river, or the aquifer system, or the biological corridor for the migration patterns of animals. And so we organize the projects into the landscape. And we start to see how the landscape functions as a whole. And then we see things like this. That's Elise again, my daughter. <laughs> um, this is one of our centropic agroforestry projects. And I wanted you to see this because this was nothing but invasive grass. This one taller tree was there, but it was just invasive grass. And this is a picture taken after about three months in a centropic agroforestry system that grows about 30 species of plants all of which have beneficial uses for humans. So there are models of not just agriculture or agroforestry. This is actually called agroecology, which is that you get all of the benefits you would get from an agricultural system by building real ecosystems. This system is designed so that it builds soils as quickly as possible by cycling of biomass without needing irrigation because we have densely planted some uh, succulents and cactus plants that store the water in their bodies and that release it to the leaves nearby of plants that are planted very close by. So that we're using the benefits of a forest and its natural interactions are designed into the dense planting of a centropic agricultural system. And so here, you can see that after, this is the tropics, so things do grow faster there. This is after about two and a half months. This is another centropic agroforestry project. That's my friend Antonio. I wanted to show you this picture because he's a normal heighted guy. He's a little taller than me. This is after two months. After two months, they have all these plants densely planted. They've got the corn shooting up. They've got about 20 different crops. This uh, system is designed to continually produce food. That there are some plants that produce food after two months, others that are after a year. The nuts and the fruits are maybe after five to eight years. And so that this system will always be producing food at different stages in its development. So the idea is that we can take those interdependencies in nature and we can design with them right down to the scale of a little one meter square of plants. Where in that one meter square, we might plant 30 different species and 500 seeds. And the seeds that are fixing nitrogen, like the beans, they grow faster. But then we cut them down and drop their, their bodies, their biomass, to build the soil. And then when there's enough nutrients in the soil, the cacao seed that makes chocolate, a nut tree, it might just sit there dormant until there are enough nutrients. And then it comes up later when the system is ready. And so a system like this shows us the principle that if there are interdependencies in nature, we can work with them to create synergies. And those synergies can accelerate the process of creating resilience. This is a very resilient way to grow food. But you don't just grow food with it. You grow community. Because see, we built these systems as workshops. And in the workshops, we had about 30 members of the community come together. And they spent day one in a classroom learning the principles and the ideas of centropic agroforestry. And then day two and day three, they planted about 8,000 plants. This was in an area about 100 meters by 50 meters in size to create a demonstration project. The thing I want you to notice is how miserable they are. <laughs> and look, there's Felipe with, with one of his kids, the same Felipe as before. And what I want you to see here is that the humans are part of the system. Humans are integrated into the system. The humans are part of the harmony of the interactions that are creating synergies in the system. It's not by accident. So they planted them in lines for maintenance purposes. 
They planted them in lines so that you would have your main productive yields from the 20 or 30 different crops. And then between them, we grew plants that grow biomass. They just grow really quickly. You chop them like grass. You, know, you cut the grass, it keeps growing. Just keep chopping them and dropping them to grow the biomass where all these plants are until they form a can canopy structure, which takes, in this place, in the tropics, takes about a year. And then it starts to function like a forest. And so the idea is the humans are coming close together, and so are the plants, and we're using the knowledge of how the earth works to grow a forest that is also an economy. Because you see, we plant this cactus that has flowers that attract the pollinators and the birds, that grows fruit. This guy grows a really delicious fruit. And that guards the water in its body and releases them through its pores and if we have another plant nearby, this guy becomes an irrigation system. But right next to it, we grow cotton. Cotton is native to, north, to the northern Andes. It's where it comes from. And this is a native kind of cotton. And this can be used for making clothing. So we can have pollinators and irrigation and other things that one plant is doing. And then we have textiles and textile materials from another, all within the same system. And so when we look at the Earth, with this point of view, we can see that creating resilience is a process of nested regeneration. Just like how that nested pattern I talked about, the different scales, up and down, the relationships between the scales is where the big effect happens. So look, it's not just Africa that's organized this way. Continents seem to like to organize themselves around water. Here's South America with all of its river systems. And if you look, there we are, the Barichai Ecoversity, our little design school, 500,000 hectares of land. Seems big until you look at the whole continent. You're like, huh, they're not going to get to the continental scale that way, are they? But what if other landscapes do the same thing? What if other places organize around their watersheds and we collaborate with each other? There are 200 rivers in the Amazon. That's 200 landscape projects. Each one focused on the entire river to build a local economy integrating the humans into the health and the well-being of the entire river. And this is how we regenerate a continent. So let's go back to where we are in Toronto. You know, I'm not from here. I grew up in the Midwest in the United States. I live in South America now. But I'm really intrigued by landscapes. And I came here and saw you guys had something really cool. You've got a giant sponge. You guys know that, right? You've got this really cool giant sponge. It's called the Oak Ridges Moraine. It's like 160 kilometers across. It produces the source waters for 64 waterways. It's sort of incredible. It has a giant sponge. You guys have like an, an embarrassment of riches for water here. So imagine if you could organize yourselves as a bioregion and build the strength of this capacity for synergy and symbiosis with everything that's already here. Well, if you did that, then you might say, well, we're still in the Great Lakes, this planetary reserve of great significance. What if we collaborate with other waters? What if we meet up with the people on Lake Erie or Lake Huron and maybe just Lake Simcoe and we start collaborating and say, maybe we should go to a little bit larger scale. Oh, those guys down in the Finger Lakes down there in New York. Huh. You know, Rochester is so close from Toronto, I feel like you could just skip a rock across the lake. And I was like, and also down here, Oh wait, this is where tens of millions of people live in New York and Boston and all those places. Where are they going to go when sea level rises? Where do you think they're going to go? So the well-being of those people depends on your well-being. Because if you guys did a great job up here and no one helped them, guess who's going to come with pitchforks and try and kill you for your food? Like what happened in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we have to find ways to collaborate and help each other because we are interdependent. Their well-being is literally tied to ours on a crowded planet. We might identify sister cities, like Penny and I. Penny's my partner. We're traveling around right now. We're going to be in Cleveland next week. We're also going to be in Binghamton and Ithaca and Rochester. Joking, we're like on a rock star tour because you know eight cities in 12 days. But Cleveland, down here on Lake Erie with the Cayuga River, they're trying to do similar things. 
Maybe you guys could collaborate and share best practices, get some ideas. Maybe some of your kids from up here could go learn from what they're doing down there. Their kids could come up here to learn from you. And then you've got the world's largest forest. Do you know the boreal forest is twice as large as the Amazon? It goes all the way around the Arctic Circle. And because of the way global warming works, it's going to get hit hard by global warming. About five times the heating around the Arctic Circle than at the equator. This massive, massive forest is in your backyard. And so we've got to work on protecting it. So the point is that these interdependencies scale across landscapes. And that's the way we can organize ourselves. So, oh my gosh, look, North America, organized naturally by water. <laughs> OK, this seems to be something continents like to do. So if you guys are over here in the Great Lakes, and you're like getting busy working on all this collaboration in the Great Lakes, the strategic reserve of the planet, you know the indigenous people, the Algonquins, they all, when they were living here in Toronto, they would sometimes take their canoes and go across Lake Huron through the Northern Channel, and then they'd jump over to Lake Superior and go all the way to the western end. And you know what's at the westernmost point of Lake Superior? Duluth, Minnesota. You know what's in Duluth, Minnesota? The Mississippi River. That's where it starts. And so if people were to start collaborating up and down the Mississippi River, we could regenerate a lot of the continent. And you know, the Missouri River goes all the way to Montana. The Ohio River goes all the way to New York. The Arkansas River goes all the way to Colorado because the Mississippi River covers 40% of the continental United States. There is a natural organizing pattern for regenerating the Earth. And it is the way that nature does it. And we can actually regenerate entire continents this way. Well, let's not stop there. What if we created bioregional networks on every continent? You know, we might give Antarctica a pass for now and just focus on the other continents. But this is how we regenerate the Earth. We regenerate the Earth one landscape by one landscape all across the planet collaborating with each other. This is the only way. It's the only way to do it. Notice how different this is from retrofitting your house with solar panels or buying an electric car. It's deeper than that, much deeper than that. And so we see that the entire planet is our focus of cooperation, the entire planet, because there are the nested levels up and down. And if other parts of the planet don't take care of themselves, we're still in trouble. And if we don't take care of our part, other people are in trouble because we're all part of the same planet. And that's not just like a beautiful thing to write in a Hallmark card. It's how the interdependencies work. And so you could also come visit us in Barichara, plant some cedar trees. That's a tropical cedar. They, they don't look the same as the cedars up north. But the real question is, are you ready to become an earth regenerator, to be doing regenerative work where you are with the mindset that it's part of the whole earth? And then what you're doing is helping to regenerate the earth by working on the part where you are, to be a good steward, a good guardian of your own place. And can you organize yourselves into a bioregion? The answer is yes. We've already been talking to some of the leads of the conservation authorities, of the Rouge Park, people from city, different city councils. And I'm not going to lie, it's going to be really challenging to do it here. You've got this massive global economy turning everything into concrete and destroying farmland and all kinds of stuff. We all know that story. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's necessary. And the most powerful thing is the story, the story that helps us come together. We are building our coherent, integrated bioregion as all others are in other parts of the world. That's the story for how we regenerate the Earth. And so that's what I'd love to talk with you about now. Because as far as I can tell, the conversation that most people are having about how to solve our problems, remember their predicaments, they're not problems, are not actually getting to the depth and the seriousness of where we are in the world. And so I'd love to just open it up for, for questions, for commentaries, and for us to start a conversation.
What I've learned about land, like you said about catchments, is that the land organizes the complexity. So the complexity is still there, but it becomes manageable because the land holds it. And so if you were to ask, how do we manage an entire watershed? And you go, you know, if you start walking around in the watershed, you'll see different soil types and all kinds of things and different stories and different histories and it gets really complex, but it's all in the watershed. And so what's really powerful is to recognize that the shape of the land itself helps us to organize ourselves. And as we do that, we start to connect more with that organizing pattern of the land. And then there's an intelligence to it. There's a way that it works that we start to recognize more. And I know with the lovely folks at Val's house and we were having lunch today, you could just tell they were all really connecting to how do the trees grow? How do the animals move around in our farm? You could feel all this connection to the intelligence of the rest of nature, and just the way that they're living. The same happens when you're in a watershed. Like if you go fishing or you go hiking or you just go sit and meditate by a, by a stream, you start to feel the natural intelligence of the watershed. And there's nothing mystical about this, although you can be mystical about it, but it's just that this is what happens. Our bodies attune to the environment we're in and it changes how we're thinking. So there's real power in, in telling the stories, as you were saying, but also living the story with our bodies. Like, how am I a part of this river? Well, right now, I may not have any sense of that, but I, maybe I should go walk along the river. Maybe I should do weekend hikes. Maybe I should go fishing. Maybe I should join a little restoration project and volunteer in the local park, something, and start to find what is my story? What is my body's story? Because what this opens up is a topic we didn't talk about today, but it opens up the feeling of belonging. And the feeling of belonging the feeling of connection, these are really powerful things. And so the feeling of belonging emerges through our experience. So that's the other thing that we can do is we can create a framework for policy, like in the city government, by having experiences in the community connected to the land. And by the way, this can be fun. You could have a music festival, right? You could do all kinds of things to connect. But the connection of the body to the land changes how we experience the narrative. What is the story of my place? It changes as I experience different parts of myself in the place. And then you can imagine all kinds of things, like what if we were to have a group of people go sit by the river and imagine their ancestors and how they feel about it, and then have a dialogue. Or to imagine the ancestors of the place if you're an immigrant. How do I feel about being in the land of someone else's ancestors? You can just, all I'm getting at is you can explore the stories inside yourself together with other people in the land. Well, let me say something that I found in other landscapes, and then I'll also say that Brian and Susan have been working with a variety of indigenous communities. We were together with Dr. Dan Longboat on Tuesday at Pickering College. And so the, we have relations, I'd say they have, I'm not from here, they have relationships like this. But I wanna say something I've observed in many landscapes, which is that the indigenous people often have good reason not to come to the colonizer's table. And so we saw this when we were on the western slopes of Colorado with the Ute tribe, which is the people that uh, were in the territory of Colorado, and that in that particular place, there were many efforts to engage with the Ute people and in very genuine, heartfelt ways. And the Ute people had several hundred years of betrayal and mistrust and trauma and good reason not to participate. And so I just wanna name that this part, this element of decolonization, reclamation and building of trust is incredibly delicate and sensitive, incredibly important and it's something that is woven across the tapestry of the conversations, but it's often invisible in the sense that it may not show up in this room, but it's present in many of the conversations. And so just recognizing the, the complexity that's involved with it. I think the most important thing is to cultivate a shared identity around this whole landscape as the place that you identify with. And I say that because 
As you look at these different parts, as you just named, the escarpment is different from the eastern part of the moraine, but they're connected ecologically in a, in a variety of ways. That right now what we have is a lot of fragmentation and competition. Even if you look at the conservation authorities, they have their own focused area, and they do the best they can within it. And we can see that overall there's a lot of good work. But how would you imagine something like a, a regional food system? A regional food system needs a regional identity. And so I think that this focus on shared identity, it's more powerful than it seems. It's a really big deal because it allows us to see how we're part of something bigger and creates a framework for collaboration. And then also there are various ways to build structures, like there might be a, an oversight council, there could be various kinds of multi-stakeholder multi groups. There are lots of ways that it could be organized, but it wouldn't even organize at all without building a shared identity. So I think that's one of the really critical pieces in all of this. So I'll reiterate that for those who couldn't hear. The brief version was, how do you fund your work? The more elaborate version was, I'm with a group of awesome people doing awesome things, and we're all volunteers, and we don't even own the land and could get kicked off, and we have to earn money. Standard story, right? Because this, this is chronic. So let me start by saying I'm funded by having people who donate money to Patreon. I have not found institutional supporters to do this work. They don't understand it. But I'm able to do that because I definancialize my life, which means I had the early starter advantage. I was born into poverty, which means I was working class farmer poverty. So I learned how to you know, live without security and money and found creative ways like poor people do. And then I eventually learned how to live with less and less expenses to be able to find a balance between a very small amount of money supporting what I do to be able to keep doing it because I don't have very many expenses. But that is not scalable. So that's not like a solution for anyone else. What I would say is this, there are, are at least two fundamental problems that are implicit in your context. One is that we need money. What is money? Do we all remember money is debt issued as interest-bearing loans that people have to work and pay off to someone else that they owe the loan to? But this idea that someone owns the land to make someone else pay a debt relationship to it is where private land ownership was invented. And so part of the problem is we have to change land ownership. That's a huge conversation. So we may not start there, although if you can find a way to create a community land trust, have a group of people going together and buy a piece of land and make it so that it's owned by a community, then that community doesn't need to charge money for it. So there are ways to step out of the debt relationship and liberate land. So there, what I'm saying is there are maybe steps a few, further, few steps further down that make more lasting solutions. But in the immediate part, the first step is to recognize that money is not the most valuable kind of wealth that we have. What do we do with money? We spend money on labor and materials. If I buy my phone, my phone is made by labor and materials. And so, if we want to create something together, we need labor and materials. So if we can collaborate with other people, like so-and-so is growing food, but they've also got a spare room in their house, but they need labor, and I want to learn how to grow food the way they do, so they invite me to do a work exchange and stay with them and help them on their farm. That's a value exchange that didn't use money. And so part of this is to find creative ways to not need money. Now that's, you can see that I'm, I'm peeling off pieces of the onion because there's actually no simple solution. This is also a predicament. But I wanted to name some of these elements because if it was as simple as where would I find the money, like, oh, this foundation funds this, well, then you'd end up with the same scarcity problem competing with each other for that tiny pool of money for the huge need, and it doesn't actually solve anything. And so part of this is to recognize that within our communities, there is huge stored value. Stored value. Value that is somewhere within the community. And the question is, why can't I find it or access it? Why do I need to pay someone money to get what I need? And the simple answer is that there is not enough trust. 
Because if neighbors know each other and they trust each other, then they can share value with each other without being concerned, like, I'm not going to do that unless you pay me. I don't trust you to help me. I better get my money. And so trust is the secret to freeing ourselves from money debt. And that can be that someone owns land, even though there may be long-term challenges with land ownership. Someone owns, you know, it's challenging because it's complicated and it creates exclusion and all kinds of, kinds of things that break down cooperation. So there are ways to cooperate that just pretend the ownership of land isn't important, which is to say, I own this farm, but I'm happy to cooperate with people who are working on the same goals I am. And I'll work with those people so my ownership of land isn't what's important. What's important is the purpose we have together and the trust we build between us. I'll give, uh, I'll start with an example on the Los Plateau of China. So there's a really great documentary, if you haven't seen it, called Green Gold. John D. Liu is the, the filmmaker. And it tells the story of the Los Plateau in China, which is more than 100,000 acres of land. I forget exactly, maybe 120 or 130 acres of land that had been degraded from 5,000 years of Chinese civilization into an extreme barren desert. And in the span of about 20 years, they transformed the entire region into like a green paradise and a major organic farming center. Part of how they did it was that they, because the local farmers were pretty much like, well, this idea of bringing, you have, know, you know, doing you know, all the ideas, the way that you would shape the land, the way you plant the trees, there was like all of that stupid. They basically, they thought that it would make it worse and it was because those farmers did not understand ecology. So they didn't know how it worked. So it was really hard to convince people who lived there and farmed there, who had helped destroy the land in some respects, to get them to change their practices when they had a particular view. So what the government did, which was pretty brilliant, was they said, well, we will give you land tenure. It, you as the farmers in this region, if you will help regenerate it, we'll give you the land, which in China, you know, the socialist country, was a, was a big deal. And so the farmers participated in that context by giving them the ability to be sure that they could benefit in the future. And this is after the Cultural Revolution when lots of people were killed. And so you know this, this thing of, of being given power back to have the ability to, to have their families benefit from it into the future was really helpful in that particular context. So that's one example. That's just, it's interesting because it changed the land ownership, but in a very peculiar way because of the cultural context it was in. But it does demonstrate the role of land ownership, or at least of, of land stewardship and management, because I don't know legally how they did it, but, but at least flexibly in that space. Another example that I've seen is a place called the Children's Eternal Rainforest in Costa Rica, which is starting in the late 1980s, a group of children in Sweden. They raised more than a million dollars in like 1987, which was in incredible, a group of seventh and eighth graders before the internet, to try to protect the, 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 the big blue morpho butterfly in the biodiversity of Costa Rica. And that's why so many people know about Costa Rica now is these big biodiversity campaigns in the 80s and 90s. And what grew out of it was a biosphere reserve with 120,000 acres of land. And it's a patchwork quilt of conservation land owned by the government and privately owned land where people set up an appeasement where they got tax benefits or other things in exchange for participating in creating a huge ecological corridor because there's a biodiversity hotspot. And there they've blended the ownership through easements. Something I've seen in Costa Rica, I'm sorry, in Colombia, is Colombia has a really interesting model where they created a type of um, agreement, which is based on agreement with the tax agency of the federal government, that says, we will treat your land as though it's a nonprofit, so you don't pay uh, property taxes, in, a, in, a, in exchange for demonstrating ecological benefits. And they have two models for this. One model is called a private nature reserve. And the other one's called a civil society nature reserve. A private nature reserve, which was actually sort of badly designed legally, because it said, you set your land aside and you're not allowed to touch it. Strictly hands off conservation, which means you can't reforest it. So they sort of designed that one badly. 
Um, but the Civil Society Nature Reserve was sort of like the B Corp, if you know what a B Corp is, where you say, we will agree to a certain, set, a certain um, list of social and ecological benefits in exchange for tax benefits, which is our land becomes tax exempt, like a nonprofit. And so it's sort of like applying for a nonprofit status of your land, but you could also think of it like an easement. So it's privately owned land with social benefit legally protected in the courts, but in the tax courts. And so I find that an interesting example too. So what I'm getting at here is that there are ways to hack the legal system and to hack ownership, where you're like, okay, there's an ownership framework, there's a, a legal framework in this particular country, they do it a particular way, and we find a creative uh, integration or amalgamation of what exists to do what we wanna do. So if there's a group of us that wanna protect land for native ecology, but like the Civil Society Nature Reserve could be that it's ecotourism, it could be that it's education, you know, where you can actually have a business and make money on it, as long as you don't contradict your ecological or social benefits, which is why it's like a B Corp. And so what I think is interesting is these blended spaces where the laws don't really know what to do, just like the, the rights of nature movement where you give the river rights, how do you enforce that? It's, it's like we're making it up as we go. And so, so this cobbling together, this creative hacking is always gonna be part of it. And so, um, so that's what I would say in general is there are a lot of ways to do it and that mostly they're about creative hacking of what exists. Because you get into community land trusts and community land banks and how co-housing models work. There are lots of specific models that are interesting, but every one of them is hacking the legal system. They're using existing law together with another law in a novel way. And that, that's what I think is really interesting about how land use is changing over time. I've come to a place of being fairly confident that most activism is not working today. And maybe say it in that way, it's not working today. And what I see is more powerful is actually changing the way we live and the way we relate to each other. And I find that to be more powerful in a variety of ways, including that unlike what most activism does, which is poke our traumas but doesn't heal them, is that the actual work of doing regenerative things heals us. And I, and I experience that healing myself and I see it in others put all of our energy into the systems we need. And what I found is when I see people do that, there are these deep transformations that occur that are incredible in their power and that they show where our real power is, which is to work toward creating the reality we want instead of protesting against the reality we don't want without articulating it. And I wanted to name this, I'd, I'd really like to be able to bring this to a close because we're over time. But this is really important because it relates to how late it is in the game, and what does and doesn't work. And we're in a time where we don't need more war, violence, and conflict, or the language of battles. Now is the time for the healers. And when the healers come, they will heal the soils, they will heal the rivers, they will heal our hearts, they will heal, heal our ancestral lineages, and there is a path with real power. And so with that, um, Brian or Susan, would you, is there anything you'd like to share before we close? I know they're over there having a side chat. But thank you all for this, for your attention.